facilitate the transition from document based to model based development starting from requirements with an a railway example from the ibm engineering so before that a brief intro about uh, what is incoze and uh, incoze india uh, so we have we have incoze uh, about 19000 plus members where there are around 65 plus uh, chapters are there who are working ac across the globe so one of the chapter which we have is uh, incoze in india and also this webinar is being organized by asia oceana chapter so we have around different working groups under different domains like aerospace medical there are different architecture groups uh, across the globe and total number of certified members are around 4000 uh, across the globe so if the coming to the india chapter so india chapter we have won the uh, the one of the most growing uh, chapter into the the sector so it we have received an award of most improved performance in one year and even in 2019 the gold circle award from it then we have chartered as an india south chapter in the 2010 and around 210 uh, 210 individual members and we have over 180 cab associate members and till now the certified members are around 60 plus in which uh, this includes ecep acep and ceps so there are three local uh, technical working groups under that architecture mbsc and phf so for more details you can reach out to us uh, we have today uh, with us in cosep india chapter president mudit have joined i have even given some contact details at the end of the presentation because we have received few queries like uh, they want to present or they want to contribute or they want to join so we have uh, the last we will share the uh, contact details where you can contact or email us uh, coming to the uh, the asia osha we have a asia oceana systems engineering conference aosec 23 uh, this year in october uh, which is being organized at bangalore so for that the theme of this uh, conference is engineering a sustainable future versus digital forward and for that already pa paper submission has started so i request all the uh, interested folks or the into the system engineering domain to uh, reach out this we have a website at aosec23.in where all the details will be uh, get and the the details about the paper submission yeah. the presentation submission uh, all these details are mentioned yes so, uh, akshay akshay so we just want to add one point so we have increased the deadline so deadline for submission of paper has changed to 30th of march and we will soon be announcing it on the website by maybe tomorrow so looking forward for all the participation even for paperless presentation the date is extended to 15th of april now so yes. i request all of you to participate and uh, communication will be sent down soon to all of you thank you modi thanks a lot my pleasure <laughs> yes. thanks modi yeah coming to the uh, today's presentation so this is about the uh, webinar that how engineering organizations can facilitate from migration of document based to model based with an example of uh, railway sector we have two speakers today who are the mbsc experts uh, marco is a senior technical representative from ibm engineering he has around 10 years of experience in mbsc and uh, plm adoption and before that he was working with airbus and he also uh, chairs uh, into the railway industries aerospace defense in europe china north america and he is also head of international ple working group at incoze uh, thank you marco for uh, as a speaker for being uh, making your time and uh, sharing your valuable knowledge so we have other speaker nicolas who is uh, uh, leading the mbsc consulting firm and is an mbsc expert with, uh, with around 10 years of experience into the uh, engineering expertise like railways aerospace as well as the uh, technical background of mbsc modeling and systems engineering and simulation advanced communicator and his main focus is to deliver top quality products on time aligned and business objective so we have given uh, both of the uh, the website details of the uh, marco as well as Nicol nicolas so i thank both of you uh, for uh, jo joining this session and uh, being uh, sharing your knowledge as a speaker so at the end of the session we will share their personal email address if anyone has any queries to uh, they can reach out to them yeah over to you nicolas uh, this thank you so very much yeah i'll stop sharing <laughs> okay so i will share my screen as well yeah. So you see the presentation, right? Yes, Nicholas. 
Okay, excellent. Yes. So thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the INCOSI organization of this event. Uh, and also the people on the line that could join uh, this presentation today. So together with Marco, we are going to uh, present you how can we facilitate the transition from document-based to model-based development, starting from requirements. So uh, the presentation will be split in two. Uh, there will be a first part that is, uh, let's say, a bit more theoretical, and then a second part with a practical example. And uh, uh, we decide to choose an example that is uh, coming from uh, our experience and with, um, let's say, uh, railway industry, uh, because they are strongly uh, driven by uh, requirements. And uh, we want to show that it's feasible to make this transition, even with, let's say, very complicated uh, uh, industry where there is like a uh, strong uh, culture of uh, uh, document based. So um, it's my first uh, INCOSI event in Asia, so uh, I hope you will uh, enjoy it. And um, if you have uh, any question, please uh, use the chat or uh, uh, send me uh, any emails. Uh, I will be happy to, to, to answer, answer them. You can also uh, add me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, to introduce myself, so I'm Nicolas Znikitas. I'm uh, leading MBSC uh, Consulting. Our main goal in the company is to coach train and uh, provide expertise uh, to our customer, introducing system engineering as a, a foundation towards to uh, MBSE capabilities uh, within their organization. To do so, uh, we have uh, specific methods uh, and approach to support this transition conducted by uh, experts in the domain. We also uh, develop a specific project to enable a smooth uh, transformation in this journey. And uh, finally, but not the least, uh, IBM is one of our uh, key uh, partner in this uh, journey. In terms of background, so I'm a, a system engineer and a model-based specialist, uh, together with a, a simulation topic and uh, advanced uh, model analysis. I started my career in the railway industry uh, with um, big man manufacturers like uh, Alstom, uh, Bombardier, and, and so on. Recently, I moved to the aerospace uh, with some key uh, players uh, in on the field. So uh, I can say that I have a, a wide uh, experience in the industry and uh, also in system development. Um, I dedicated my uh, entire career to support and uh, evangelist the model-based and system engineering approach. Uh, together with Marco, uh, we uh, collaborating like since uh, a long time now uh, on the topic, and uh, it's a pleasure that uh, for us we can uh, share this experience today. So I think Marco, you can introduce yourself as well. Yeah, uh, since it's the third webinar of the series, so I think uh, people already got to know me, so I would not spend so many words about myself, just that after many years of experience uh, in the field as a practitioner, as a consultant, as an expert for MBSC, uh, implementing MBSC in different industry, uh, last, uh, uh, last August, I decided to make a big move from uh, Europe to Singapore, and uh, I rejoined uh, IBM, but this time as a tool vendor. So that's why uh, I, I will try uh, to combine uh, all the practitioner experience also with the, with the software uh, uh, so vendor uh, role that I have now. And, uh, and that's basically uh, my goal at the moment is to develop engineering uh, 
digital transformation engineering, uh, application lifecycle management, model based system engineering within the Asian territory, Southeast Asia, but also South Korea, uh, Australia, and if needed, also support in China and India. Okay, so that, that's a bit of an introduction about myself. Please, Nicola, you can continue. Very good. Thanks, Marco. So let's have a look to the agenda. Um, there will be four parts. The first, uh, like we will start with an introduction of the topic, um, then moving to requirement engineering management, why it's so important towards uh, the MBAC uh, journey that will also uh, enable the transition to uh, the requirements and model hybrid. So we will see what is, let's say, the correct balance when making this transition. And at the end, uh, Marco will make a, a, a demo uh, with a practical example with the IBM toolchain. So um, uh, I forgot to mention that I'm based in, in, in Europe, uh, just for you to know in terms of timelines. It's a bit uh, early for me, uh, but I will do my best to bring you the key messages in this presentation. And again, uh, don't hesitate to raise questions. There will be, uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, a few minutes to answer a few of, of them. So let's start with uh, um, increasing system complexity. So what does it mean? If we take a look uh, back in the last period of time, so we see that the systems in our uh, world, let's say, has been um, increasing slightly in terms of complexities, um, but mostly in the starting from the 18s, we see that there is a um, typical growth of uh, functions, features that customers required, so which increase also the number of uh, um, components, interactions, interfaces, and so on and so on. So why do we have such ob observation? So if we have a look, this is because the technology has driven the complexity to a next level. Uh, before we were speaking about mechanical and electrical uh, domains, and more and more we integrated with electronics, softwares, network, which increase dr drastically the complexity. And most recently with AA, so we have, for example, like autonomous car. So this really increase the complexity of our systems. There is also another aspect. So I call it scope driven, which means that before we were focusing on single components that is now integrated into systems, systems integrating with other systems and with bigger systems. So this at the end of the day really increase the interaction and it start to be very complex to manage. So it's something that it's coming also from system engineering vision of Incosi 2035. So it's really some, uh, it's shared across the uh, community. And um, yeah, that's, that's, I will say the statement that we can take. So if we have a look of concrete example, as I was mentioning in the railway, um, we have, let's say at the beginning, some train with uh, a, a driver that uh, drive the train, I would say. And uh, now we have uh, uh, trains that are autonomous without drive driverless. So uh, as you can see on both pictures, the complexity of components, of integration, of elements has increased. We have uh, PSD, we have uh, dedicated uh, communication systems, uh, we need uh, uh, indications. So increasing of features, increasing of uh, interfaces, 
that at the end of the day, we need to be able to manage. So where do we start? Let's say requirements are the starting point to everything. Why? So if we see project development, scoping, cost, testing, scheduling, configuration management, it's all about requirements. And what happens if we don't manage them properly? So if we take an example uh, back in the 2016 with uh, uh, SNCF, I think you, you heard about it. Um, the train couldn't be operating the station because they were too wide and they couldn't fit in the, in the platform. So uh, we have also recently the same example with uh, um, famous uh, uh, Spanish uh, com company and operators that the train cannot enter into tunnels. Um, so why do we have this kind of uh, uh, observation? And uh, this is probably because uh, people has a difficulty in, uh, uh, in this approach and needs proper methods, proper tools to manage also their requirements. So in, in these pictures, I think for some of you that um, are familiar with requirements and the uh, textual requirement with documents, you all, let's say, has experimented some problem when you, know, uh, you miss some uh, emails, you are not able to, um, let's say, um, validate the requirements, the consistency of the formats, the, the re uh, how it is readable, how do you review the requirements, the different source of requirements, so meaning that uh, you are not able to uh, manage them in terms of configuration. People has different point of view of the requirements uh, when they are textual based and document centric. And also it's different to, let's say, link them to uh, the, the rest of the, of the world, I will say. So coming back with this observation, we need a, a solution to these problems. So this introduced the, the part of requirement engineering and management. How do we do that? One way is to move from document centric to uh, requirements database and repository. So we use, let's say, a specific tools. We can take an example with uh, doors next gen, uh, with a semantics that is behind with a data models that organize this, uh, this data into a proper uh, repository. Of course, a tool is not enough. Uh, we have uh, standards so like uh, the, the ISO 15288 uh, or other ISO to uh, requirements uh, uh, system engineering that is important to apply. And uh, let's say following just the standard is not enough as well. We need these uh, combinations of elements to be able to correctly manage the requirements. But is it enough today? So if we uh, have a look in the um, applying the standards, so we have, let's say, um, for example, stakeholder requirements that are traceable to uh, system requirements. Those requirements can be allocated to elements in your, uh, let's say, in your design. But at the end of the day, how do you ensure the consistency of, of this whole? How do you um, ensure that you don't miss any requirements, that you have performed a correct traceability? that you are able to, to do VNV activity, for example. So we need to prove that the requirements are consistent with the design. There is here like something missing, I will say. 
if we take an example, practical example, so coming from experience that we had in the past together with Marco, um, in requirements, there is different type of requirements, okay? You have, um, as we, we saw in the previous uh, slide, uh, stakeholder uh, and needs requirements coming from customers, coming from uh, standards, coming from, I would say, internal uh, knowledge uh, within the companies. Those requirements are uh, cascades, are derived into operational requirements, architecture, functional performance ones, um, derived to subsystems. So you see that we have a multitude of type of requirements with a lot of links, a lot of uh, 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 interdependence, and it's really important to ensure that all of them are consistent, understandable, and so on and so on. So this is where you need models, okay, towards to MBSC. As we saw in the uh, document-based approach, there is many challenges, okay? So within an organization, you have different type of people communicating to each other. Some people are responsible of systems, of subsystems, testing, safety. They are following the process in terms of development of the, their systems. And if we see there is different tools, uh, different source of, uh, of truth, it's complicated to make a, a system engineering activity in such kind of ecosystem. So when you move to a, a model-based approach, you have, I would say, a single source of truth that is interconnected. So people can uh, bring on the table a lot of added value. So here, if you are familiar, like the basic one is to uh, having a better communication, understanding of the systems, you can uh, detect in the early stage errors, especially with uh, um, model uh, analysis like simulation or, and so on. You can easily, let's say, make uh, impact analysis uh, within your models. And since it's all interconnected, you can check like what is uh, consistent, what is not, and you will save a lot of time and, and cost associated, of course. You improve uh, the way that you manage your interfaces and uh, uh, together the with the requirements, you have end-to-end uh, -end pictures. So there is some myth about uh, MBSC because um, like this, people will say, okay, MBSC is the, the solution to our problem, but you, you probably heard that MBSC is hard to start because you need, uh, I will say, a lot of uh, uh, skills, a lot of investment in terms of budget. Uh, you need uh, uh, proper uh, tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you look uh, better, um, there is like some um, starting point that you can do, and uh, we believe that with requirements you can cover a large scope with uh, a limited uh, amount of effort. I will say, um, and that you will bring already a lot of results in, inside your company. Um, we can take also another example, like MBAC will eliminate all the documents. So this is not true, I will say, because um, MBAC, if you uh, uh, cut the word, there is system engineering inside, so um, which is uh, uh, still uh, document centric. So out of the model, we are able to um, generate documents together with uh, uh, requirements. So it's uh, an enabler to do uh, system engineering activities. Then there is other ones. Uh, I will uh, uh, let you the, the, the chance to read them. But what is important is that at the end of the day, MBSC depends also on the way that you implement it. So it's really important that you have, uh, let's say, uh, strategy uh, to go through and some uh, use cases where to start, okay? To not take the overall scope because we will see that there is like different maturity gates in this journey. And uh, uh, what we propose today is 
to start with the, the requirements. So uh, a typical uh, MBSC journey. Usually what we do is that we start with textual requirements and I will say document based. So it means that uh, you don't have a, a, a database to manage them uh, is uh, let's say a Word document, Excel or whatever formats. When when you uh, let's say um, improve your uh, uh, your approach, you go to document centric and database. So we saw an example uh, with uh, with doors that uh, you structure your requirements into a tool. You follow a standards. Uh, you have a way uh, to manage them to make traceability. And with time, we see that uh, the quality and the accuracy of the deliverables getting higher, okay? So this is what we call, let's say, requirement-based engineering. And when you make the transition to uh, model-based, there is uh, a step where you have a, a kind of hybrid, hybridity between requirements coming from uh, database and models that can be managed like for example, in, in Rhapsody with the IBM solution and can be, uh, let's say, interconnected. Then you have uh, uh, really, uh, let's say, more uh, model-based approach that is model-centric towards to a, a model that is uh, your requirements. So you can generate out of your model the requirements. So this is really like the last step in terms of uh, uh, a journey which requires a lot of time, okay, uh, which requires skills, which requires uh, a lot of, uh, um, I will say, criteria, but you will improve dr drastically the quality of your uh, deliverables, but it requires time, okay. This is what we are in the model based engineering, and we are convinced that today the good balance to, let's say, make this transition is to stick for uh, an hybrid solution, which means that um, you uh, manage your requirements in the uh, specific database, specific tool that you synchronize with models, where in the models you can, uh, let's say, um, refine them, you can bring uh, a lot of added value, that we will see uh, with a, a concrete uh, workflow. So how do we integrate models and uh, uh, requirements and what are the benefits? Uh, so if we uh, um, have a look on this uh, workflow, um, usually what we do, we start with uh, input requirements that are need requirements coming from customers, uh, coming from standards, as we, as we saw in the example of uh, Bombardier. And uh, the first thing is to, uh, let's say, synchronize them with uh, the models that are uh, generating in specific tools where we refine these requirements and we uh, bring models to illustrate, to understand better what, they, what does it mean what, uh, what is the uh, formalism in the, in the background uh, within like what the so-called operational analysis, for example. And starting from there, we uh, use the models to let's say elicitate to uh, derive requirements out of it that can be uh, synchronized back to a specific uh, database where you can make trustability with your input requirements. So we see that here in a closed loop, we can have uh, starting from need requirements to models and system requirements, a first approach that can be uh, uh, used in the company. And this is, uh, let's say for me now, the time to give the ball to Marco to show you with a, a concrete example, uh, how we apply this workflow and what are uh, the benefits out of it? 
So Marco, yeah, thank um, you. I think you can keep the presentation. Then I will uh, I will oh, just okay. show the demo deck. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Nicolas. Um, what we want to show now is that there are many ways to combine model and requirements. So we think, according to our experience in railway, and according to the difficulties in applying MBSC, especially in requirements-driven, uh, strongly uh, requirements-driven environment industry, it's key to have the right balance. So that was the message that Nicolas was trying to send. We think that one balance could be to uh, start with uh, requirements, the input requirements that you get from the customers, from legacy projects, and to use MBSC, for example, the operational analysis, start with the operational analysis that in the railway is really important, understand all the train operations, the railway operation of your systems, and uh, uh, use the uh, models to elicitate and to derive from the model lower level requirements, more detailed requirements that you will link back to your uh, original input requirements, okay? Why do we do that? Because probably suppliers don't use models. Suppliers are not ready to use models most of the time, so they still want to have the documents. Regulators, authorities, they still want to have the, the requirement. So but at least we, uh, railway companies and also other type of business that are strongly requirement driven can start benefits from the model covering just one scope that could be the operational analysis and without going into the full modeling of all the system. OK, so let's now have a look at the workflow that we show in the demo. First, uh, the first step, what Nicolas said, the text-based requirements. So it means the requirement based on models. Um, basically, this is the, uh, the, the, the key point. So you have Excel file, you have uh, Word documents. Today, uh, we show with an Excel file, a CSV data, uh, but in general, uh, you can import uh, uh, these requirements after you have been working a lot with these textual requirements. Now you want to take them, import them inside a repository because you want to make the step two. You want to go to the database uh, textual uh, requirement, no? like the requirement within a repository, like could be IBM DOS next generation. And that's what, what you are doing now. You are importing the requirements uh, that you have done into uh, this uh, um, requirement repository. And the import today I show you, as I said, with a CSV data, but could be done also with REC if uh, there are specific standards to do that, uh, to, to import requirements. Uh, so we import the requirement, we create a database, and then we structure different levels, different specification. And then after we go into the modeling tool, in this case is Rhapsody, we take the requirement, we visualize the requirement, we don't import, we just query the requirement because the tools, the tools are linked. So it's important to have an environment that help you having the, the models linked and synchronized to the requirement. So we are querying the requirement from the requirement management tool, in this case, DNG. And then we start to analyze the requirement and then we start to create use cases, use cases that represent the train operation. So we'll see an example of that. After we go through the activity description, maybe uh, behavioral analysis with model execution, if you want to do more advanced, but you don't need to go into model execution if you are not ready for it. Then uh, we have a very good understanding of our, uh, of our uh, operations, we can start to derive functions out of that and to allocate functions to big systems, okay? And then what will happen? We can start to create derived requirements from the model. So textual requirement from the model. And uh, well, we will, will we author this requirement? We author this requirement in DNG back. So we loop back as Nicolas showed before. If you can go forward, uh, Nicolas. Uh, yes, we look back. And we will link now the system requirement that we have created out of the model. So we have used the model to elicitate this requirement to the original input requirement. And if we want to give the supplier, we don't need to share the supplier to the supplier the models, the right part. You can just share to the supplier the left part, okay? But it, you are sure that you have used the model to help you bring in this consistency between the upper level and the lower level, what we call input and output requirement in this case, okay? So we are going to show this now, showcase with a simple example from railway. The example is on purpose simple because as I said, we want to that companies start using MBSC in an easy and smooth way so they cannot take big leap in order to start that. So I will share my screen now and uh, I will, uh, so let me share, good. 
Okay, so you can see my screen, I guess. Uh, now we are in the requirement repository. Okay, so here you see IBM Engineering Requirement Management doors next generation. So don't confuse this with the old doors. Okay, doors doors is the client tick client application. That this is the web based, eh? the, the new doors. Eh? What is much more efficient that we always push customer usually to go into this, and you will see why. Eh? Some of the dependencies you will see now. Uh, so first steps, we said okay. We have here already uh, some requirement repository that we have created. So we have infrastructure requirements that they are the infrastructure requirements of the railway. So we have some requirement there for the infrastructure. By the way, this is, looks like text, but it's not text. You see, you have uh, each requirement has its own ID, has its own attributes, and uh, you can extend the different attributes of the requirements. Okay, so it's not text. And uh, then we have other type of requirements. We have the generic specification. This is our generic specification of the uh, of the train uh, for rapid train system. So we we, we call it like that. And uh, and here you have really the input requirement that come from the customer, from the stakeholders. Uh, you have like the the roles of the operators. So the scope here is bigger than the train itself. You have also the signaling system, the control, the communication, the different operators. And that's exactly how it is a complex railway project. You have the infrastructure, as I showed you before. Now here you have the different uh, uh, operations and uh, which are the main systems that we of this uh, big uh, um, uh, rapid train system. No? The, we have the, the rolling stock, the train itself, we have the signaling, we have the train control, the communication system. So here we have a specification high level provided by the customers that we need to develop. Okay, So out of this specification, we can derive, uh, sorry, we can derive the operational requirements. Okay, Operational requirements usually are also given by the clients in the railway industry. Are, a part of the ITT, the invitation to tendering. And, uh, and here we have uh, requirements for three phases of the, of the train uh, uh, operation. So we have the initialization phase when you want to start up the train, what you need to do. You have the uh, train uh, operation. So what you do during passenger uh, operations uh, with the train. So what are the activity, the key operations that you need to perform? And we have also the deep on time maintenance. So after, if, if there is a faulty train or if you have, you need to do maintenance, so you need to send the trains to the depot. So how do we do that? Okay. So these are usually the type of requirements is much simplified. So we have much more requirement. It is much more complex. But to give you an idea, the type of requirement that you may get from uh, when you start uh, a railway project. Now. Uh, if you already have done, you want to move uh, into requirements uh, management in a repository, so going to the step two, you probably the best way to do is to analyze which is your workflow, to understand which attributes you need here. So in order to have the template that you need, so you, these attributes can be customized according to the template that you want, that your company is using, and then you will import uh, Let's now try to import requirement from the Excel. Okay, so I will import the requirement. So first, I'm going to create a module. So a requirement specification, we call it new uh, requirements. Now we uh, create a module. Now the module is created, but is empty. You can see that is there, but is empty. So now we already have uh, Excel with some requirement in it. So in CSV form, so we are going to import them. So you see there are different ways to importing. So it's, it's mean that the transition from text-based first to artifact-based database uh, is not very difficult, okay? It's quite an important step that you can take. And of course, uh, with the right support, with the right solution, but it's not something uh, difficult to do. It will already bring many benefits. There is a uh, different way to import the requirements. So RecEF also we have a standard for it. But in this case, we'll go with the CSV in the import. So we just browse the file that we want to import. Here I have some files I want to import. I will import this. And, uh, and then I will uh, say create new. Okay, I want to put it inside a module. So the module that I just created. So this new requirement module, as you can see. And now I can import the requirement. Now it's completed. You see the requirement are imported. If I open this and I save the view, we call it overview. 
we can see now that the requirements are imported already in the format that you want with the attributes that you want, okay? And the format that I use in this specific case, I can open it. So it was like, I, I use a CSV data. That's what we used to import, you see? So very, uh, with all the requirements, we can have here 100 of requirements with different attributes in the column, as you can see. So this is just one way, but you can import Word document, you can use standard like Rekif to do it, okay? So first step, so we are now in step two. We are using requirements, we use requirements, we link them. For example, here we have uh, uh, the generic specification, we establish traceability between the requirements. The models are not there. So you can see here that you have uh, uh, this requirement that has uh, satisfied by another requirement. So we hold on the requirement. We see yeah, there is another requirement that is uh, satisfying this. It's a lower level requirement. So it's not just a text, a document. Really, we start to bring the requirement engineering, the uh, upstream, downstream links. We click on it and we go in the other repository. You see, so there is a link between the two repository. And this is really important because we start uh, uh, we start doing requirement engineering now, okay? Uh, again, uh, so the link, uh, uh, we have other type of link. So the emergency response, okay? So this is another link satisfying this requirement. It say the RTS will ensure efficient mitigation of service disruption in case of fault and emergency situation. So that's the coming from the high level specification. And I want to go into the related operation uh, operational requirements. Then I click on it. I can hold already have an overview, and then I can go uh, down and read the requirement in detail. Okay. So imagine that they actually have a comprehensive emergency response plan, and this requirement belong to the other specification. Okay. So the operational specification one. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just an uh, an example of. Uh, so now we are at, at the first level, as we said. So we have now the possibility. Uh, so we are now linking requirements within DNG, within the requirement database. It's already an improvement, okay? But still, how are you sure that people understand requirements? Because requirements can be written different way. Requirements, some of the requirements that you have here, uh, look at this requirement. They imply a dynamic, a behavior, a sequence of actions, okay? How are you sure that people understand and don't forget things, okay? So you see, you have the in initiation process. We are describing a process to start up the train, okay? It can be in automatic way or uh, done remotely, you know, with the, uh, the process. Basically, there is a schedule when the, the time, uh, the clock uh, reach the time of the, the, the train schedule. So automatically, the, the signaling system send a message to the train to, to wake up. And the way the train start to do the initialization activity to test all the systems. So this is a process. How you can are you sure that you understand in this process? You need probably many requirements or long requirements to write that. Okay. And now are you sure that the interdependency of these are taken into account correctly? So you need to do your operational analysis. Okay. And one way that we recommend to do the operational analysis with model. So what we do, we go into Rhapsody, and it basically. The steps, now we are in Rhapsody, so I make it a bit bigger so you can see. So what we do, we import, we uh, query the requirements. You see here we have uh, something called remote artifact package. So these requirements here are not defined in Rhapsody, in the modeling tool. These requirements are those requirements that you see in the collection, okay? So you see uh, the, the requirement that is coming from DNG. There is different collection that I want to take into account. So I start with my uh, generic, generic specification. You see there is some requirement here. This requirement cannot be edited in uh, Rhapsody because these requirements come from DNG. That's the requirement uh, management tool, the requirement repository where you need to manipulate the requirements, okay? So now, if you want to be sure about that, so we can say here, um, so you can see here the different uh, uh, requirement that you have. And, uh, and now you can say navigate to original tool. So it means that the requirements are not, are ju it's just a query. If we click on it, we go back to the original tool and we see the requirement, okay? So just to rem remember you, this is just a query that is not even imported. It's just a query, okay? You need to uh, refresh it and you need to uh, 
it's good practice actually because you should do the the, the requirement manager requirement engineering in the proper tool that's the requirement management tool and the modeling in the modeling tool no um, especially when you have many requirements so what we do now here we de highlight the requirement that we want to analyze so we just drag and drop the requirement so i can show you how we can drag and drop easily the requirement i did it already for the others so a very easy way so i will undo this and we start to model the use cases we start to model the operation that we want to focus in this case we decide okay we have this requirement that tell us that you need to initiate the train automatically as scheduled and then we another one that said okay in case uh, the train doesn't work uh, doesn't start as scheduled there's a problem with the timing system the time the, the clock then you can initiate the train remotely so the operator can from remote initiate the train uh, but then what happened if uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a problem uh, on the train or the train doesn't start up by remotely the operator can power up the train manually and also the operator can recover the train okay so these are all the use cases that are elicitated are coming refined from the models and that's why we create this link here now the link is uh, we are linking the use cases with the requirements okay and now we want to understand better uh, we establish the first traceability and then we want to uh, understand better uh, the uh, what does it mean initiate this train automatically as scheduled so we have an activity diagram and then we explain that there is a signaling system that activates the timetable then uh, check time based on timetable uh, if the time schedule is the is the right time uh, then uh, it requests the wake up of the train. If not, it go back until is the right time uh, for the train to start. And then there is a train control system that receives the request for the train to initialize. Now, this is a simple activity, but we can have complex activity that we can define and even simulate, okay? That will help us elicitating uh, the uh, requirement. Now, going back to the use case, we have also other activities like initiate the train remotely. How are we going to do that? Or let's say recovery faulty train. So we want to see. Um, so we want to see the uh, the activity for it, and it's a bit more complex complex activity. So we have the train, the signaling system, the train operator, the communication, the depot crew, and you can see all the uh, exchange of activities and information between. Uh, so the train and send the initialization failure in case of failure uh, through the signaling system, the train system report the train failure to the train operator, then the train operator select a train that replaced the previous one and inform the depot uh, through the communication system about the faulty train so that the depot uh, crew can uh, act in operation. Okay, so now these links that I show you here actually uh, you may see uh, we see the link uh, uh, at use case level what we created but this link here is also shown in uh, the, the doors uh, next generation that's why if we go back now uh, to uh, to the tool navigate to original tool we can see uh, that there is here uh, a link so why is important this step because for all those people that don't want to model that don't need to model and just they want to understand the requirements for them it's just important to read the model so the same traceability you have it back in dng so now if you look at these requirements so we have a use case diagram we show and we see that now there is a model here that the same model that i show in rhapsody which is the difference that here the user doesn't need to have the modeling tool doesn't need to know how to model just needs to know how to read the model and they can comment, uh, can see and comment uh, the model so that the modelers can see the comments, can see, uh, and then can uh, make the editing of the, uh, of the requirements in the modeling tool. So if we open here, we are not in the, we are still in the, in the requirement management uh, tool. So, uh, and here we can see that there is not a picture. No, it's really like an active element that you can analyze. We have the requirements linked to it. And now let's say that the users want to make changes on the model. So it will go to Rhapsody. So I show in the modeling tool, it will start to blink and I go back to my modeling tool. Okay. So it's really important to establish this type of connection because not everybody needs to model in the organization, especially strongly and highly requirement driven environment. You would like that 
um, less people models and more people are able to consume and read the model. Okay, with this type of setup, with uh, doors next generation. Uh, Rhapsody model manager, that's the link between uh, Rhapsody, the modeling tool and the uh, DNG, the requirements tool, then you can achieve that, okay? So, but let's move to the next steps because we don't have so much time. So, by the way, we can, have, uh, I start to create, uh, to better understand my requirements. So, I have now here uh, other type of diagram that I created. So, here I have my block definition diagram that the, with the structure of the, of my train. Uh, so, I can, of my train systems. So I can here see that there is a, a link again. So here is another diagram. So the system that are part of my uh, rapid train system, the communication the train control, the same things. Eh? If we go here, showing Rhapsody, we will uh, go into the modeling tool and we will see now the models here and we can edit the model. Here. So very smooth, very powerful to be able to combine these requirements driven approach and add the step-by-step the modeling scope. Now, um, after we uh, added another model that I created, so the, I just created a simple one, but this can really go and be, be extended. So here we can see uh, that I, I go back to the other specification. Sorry, so it was this. And I can see that we have now the, uh, the same, the generic specification. We have other type of graph, uh, other type of diagram. So, uh, in other words, we have the possibility to link uh, the um, the models. Now, after we establish this link, so we have traceability requirements model, and we can see the models in uh, in back in the requirement management tools linked to the requirement management tool. So, what we do, we have developed the different activities. So, you see the different activities. So. Uh, we have here, uh, this is another model, the context. I wanted to analyze the context to better understand the context of my train uh, systems. No? So the different systems, how they interact. So this is also important view that you can realize with the models and so on and so forth. Uh, so here we have the, now the activities. Now this activity, I want to look, I, I, I allocate it to different systems. You see the communication, the train system, the signaling system. And what I did, so what we do now, so we go into the, uh, we will have a matrix here that we show the uh, allocation between the, uh, the different parts. Eh? So we will see now uh, we have different matrices. One second, I open it. Uh, so it's I, I create a diagram. So you see here, these are the activities. Uh, established connection between control center. This is the activity that is the activity from the activity diagram that we just show. And now I start to create a derive requirement out of this activity. So these requirements are new requirement that I elicitate after I look at the, my process. After, after I can analyze my operation, I can define these requirements. So uh, more detailed than this. So this comes from the analysis, the elicitation part of the activity process. And I can say that this requirement belongs to the communication. So this function operation, it's allocated uh, to the communication systems. And these are really the derived requirements that are coming out of that, the output requirement. Same things we did for the signaling. So there is a three main function for the signaling, the activate timetable, check time based on timetable, request wake up command, and I can also derive requirement. These are output requirement. Before the other one were input requirement, now these requirements are new and are elicitated by looking, by analyzing the, uh, the, requirement, the, the model that I created, okay? So remember the loop that I showed you before, the, the workflow. Same things for the train control, two main functions allocated to it and the different requirement derived and same things for the train itself. So we have three main functions and the requirement derived. Now this requirement that I derived, where are these requirements? They are not defined in Rhapsody, but they are defined in the requirement repository. Again, because we need to do it in the requirement repository. So now we go back and we see now that this is another repository called uh, RTS systems, output requirements. So system functional requirements. So let's have a look at this repository. 
So this repository is uh, not an input requirement, but it's an output requirement because it's been coming out of the model, has been derived from the model. So if I click on it, I see that there is now a new specification called system functional requirement. They satisfy the upper level specification, the operational requirement, and, uh, and we use the model to elicitate and derive this requirement. So if we click on it, now it's interesting because first we see that these are the models uh, that we have, uh, that we have created. So for example, here you have, uh, you see the, the models that we, have, uh, that we have created are here. So you have your block definition diagram and uh, you see, so these are the models that I just created, another block definition diagram as I showed you before. And from this model, we derive this requirement as output requirements, okay? So, and these are new requirements that we derived. So, and exactly the requirement that you saw in the wraps in the modeling tool. What I did also, I want to extend my traceability. And now I have the full traceability. I have the requirement that, uh, so this is my requirement, the new requirement that I created after analyzing the model. Now these requirements are traced. So are coming out of the analysis of the models that I just showed to you again. So the, uh, this model here in Rhapsody, okay. So these are the requirements that come out of the analysis. And these requirements satisfy higher level requirements that are in the other repository. So if we, if you look back, so we satisfy this higher level requirement that comes from the higher repository. So uh, another interesting thing, maybe last one, uh, these of course can be exported. So this can, the view that I have here can be uh, export the view, so I can export the view, and I can also generate, uh, uh, create and print a PDF document outsource the view, okay? So with all my requirements, link and traceability, that's really powerful. Last but not least, I want to have a look now at the full traceability, because that's something that you have if you have the, the DNG, the Rhapsody, and this mechanism in place for change impact analysis and for uh, understanding the, the thread of your assets. So if I go now to, let's say these requirements, I want to explore these requirements. I want to see the traceability. I go to open link explorer and I start to see the, uh, so uh, this is not the right one. So let me check the, uh, the right requirement that has more traceability, probably this, uh, yeah, this is better, looks better. So we open. And we start to see that this requirement has traceability. And now it's interesting. So we start to analyze all the traceability. We have the original requirement, the really high level requirement satisfied by the operational requirement and satisfied by this other operational requirement. Then we have uh, architecture elements that are used to, uh, uh, to analyze this requirement. And then from the architecture elements, we have requirement output requirement traced that satisfies uh, the, uh, the requirements uh, above. So the new requirement that we derived and we, uh, they, they have been created as a licitation of the model. So uh, that was from my side. Um, just as a message again, it's really important that you don't take the modeling as a big uh, Everest mountain, uh, a Himalaya mountain to, uh, to climb, okay? So before climbing the Himalaya, you need to start to get used and uh, climb smaller mountains, okay, to get in shape. So that's exactly like that. Now starting first with uh, bringing your textual requirement into a requirement repository, start to get familiar with the requirement engineering process, and then you can include model with a small scope, step by step. You can still, you see, work mainly with requirements and use some of the models to elicitate part of your requirement that you want to elicitate because they are new or because they imply difficult operation, complex operation, and derive requirements, better requirements, uh, better formulated requirements out of that, okay? So that's from today. It's a, that's our two cents for today, really. Try to uh, understand how you can combine uh, requirements. Don't think about, it's very difficult to start MBSC. It's not difficult. It's possible if you have the right people behind you and also if you have the right tools, instruments and um, uh, for that, okay? 
So that's uh, said that I conclude the demonstration for today. And uh, maybe we can extend five minutes for questions because I see there were some questions. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, there are a few questions in the chat box, uh, Marco. So first is regarding in railways, how Incosa utilize the methodology or process for entire project. Okay, so. Again, there are a few more questions aligned to that only. Okay, quick, uh, quick answer for me is that when I was working at Bombardier, uh, we strongly rely on INCOSI, so System Engineering Handbook, uh, ISO standards, as we, I mean, Nicolas mentioned before. So it's the starting point is always the standard. And then you have internal practices that are based on the standards and uh, uh, are adapted. So is it possible? It's a good standard, the, uh, the ISO that we mentioned and the INCOSI System Engineering Handbook is a good starting point. But of course, probably you need to adapt it to the needs of the, the industry, in this specific case, the railway industry. So that's a quick answer for that. Because I don't know. Then we have a stage three to five as per presentation, we might need some example to manage. Yeah. Well, we try to give an example more for step three because the focus of the presentation today was step three, okay? Uh, however, you may understand that step one, is where you have a lot of documentations, okay? As Nicola show, a lot of type of requirement specification. How do are, are you are you sure that they are consistent between each other? Okay, uh, very difficult when you have this huge amount of requirements. Then the step two, I try to show a bit. So you bring things into the requirement repository, and you start to improve with traceability link, with the, uh, exploration of the, the, the threads of your requirement, structuring them in a better way, commenting them, reviewing them, okay? And then, of course, the step three, we show the, the example that you just saw. Now, four and five for today have autoscope, also because we believe that for the railway industry, you, the railway industry is not mature yet, to go into four and five. There are some companies, some departments that do it, but it's good to focus on step three. That's our recommendation. Yeah. Using IBM ELM from the contractor on board stage till the DLP manage requirement generally have some challenges. Any options to improve? Okay. Uh, till uh, yeah, from the contractor on board stage till the uh, DLP manage. So I, generally to have some challenge, any option to improve. So I think, uh, by the way, Nicolas, any other comments for the other questions? Sorry, I just... Uh... No, no, I think, yeah, it's it's clear just to uh, like point out uh, for the stage, uh, maturity stage, that um, the step four is like, for people already that has a, a big culture in terms of a model-based approach. So we usually, uh, let's say, um, put this in, in, in the landscape uh, for companies that has been already, uh, let's say, uh, involved for quite a lot of time on uh, digitalization, on model-based approach. And um, this could be because, because it requires a lot of uh, uh, trainings, coachings. Uh, it's a, a transformation that you need to bring in the company. So this step is to... Uh, far uh, when you you want to start this uh, this uh, journey and uh, that's why uh, and this is really our message today uh, the balance is in between uh, as we can uh, see uh, on this demo and uh, uh, a railway is a, a good example uh, to, to do that uh, because they are strongly driven by requirements again and uh, uh, we believe that bringing models and making the, the link is uh, one possible way. Uh, and uh, many uh, manufacturers now start to really uh, go for it. So this yeah, is our recommendation. And uh, yeah, for the other question, I cannot see in the chat. I don't know why I was trying. So, so I think I it's for Marco. IBM, the other questions using IBM, okay. ELM, yes. Um, I, sometimes, yeah, I need to understand which are your challenges because uh, yeah, yeah I, I know it's a bit difficult to uh, we maybe we skip the question because if I don't know the challenge it's difficult to comment maybe you can send me an email and we can discuss offline on that 
Word file to import. Uh, okay, a Word file is not the best format to import. Okay, because uh, is, uh, you need to, to make a, a mapping between the Word file and the, the requirements uh, uh, template that you're using. So the CSV, I would recommend either you move the, the Word into CSV first, or even better, you use Recif. So these are probably requirement standard uh, that uh, help you to uh, import, okay? But in general, if you have any question, you want to have a look with me about that, just contact me offline and we can discuss that as well. Yeah. And then Rhapsody tool development supposed to do early to contractor on board or uh, uh, during the contract stage. It really depends, okay? Now in the example is that the model it's used by the authority. In this case, could be Deutsche Bahn in Germany, could be LTA in Singapore, could be SNCF in France, uh, Tren Italia in Italy, you know, the authority. Deutsche Bahn in Germany, I already mentioned that. And uh, so the authority is using now, uh, um, could be the authority itself that is doing that, or it could be the train manufacturer, okay? So that is producing the train and the system, right? depending on the scope. If it's the authority, usually the authority have uh, input requirements, requirements that come from experience, from legacy system that they have. They want to insert new requirement that are coming from regulation, from market, and then they use the model just themselves to better understand uh, and to be able to derive requirement that they can share with their subcontractors. So in this case, there is not the involvement in the subcontractor in the model because the assumption is that the subcontractors are not mature enough to receive model and consume the model. But in other cases, if you have higher level of maturity, it could be that your subcontractors know how to model. Uh, I remember in Bombardier, there was a collaboration between Bombardier and Knorr system. So there is a supplier and uh, uh, the ray manufacturer. Uh, or in LTA, probably there is with LTA and Alstom, LTA and Siemens, you know? And that's why if the, 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 the contractor have modeling experience, why not involving them already in the process? So in the example, we assume that there was not experience because most of, most of the time is the case from the contractor. That's why we just share with them the requirements, okay? I think it was the last question. Yeah. Um, yeah, we exceeded a bit, but you know, uh, I hope it was not too bad these 10 more minutes that we stole from your Saturday. And no problem, Marco. Yeah. Uh, once again, I thank you and uh, Nicholas for your time and for sharing your uh, expertise. Uh, thank you all for joining. If you have any questions, you can please unmute and ask yourself or uh, otherwise we can end the sessions and we will share this recording on the, uh, on the Incosa YouTube channel and we'll sh share the link across all the buttons. Uh, maybe Thank Nicholas you. or Marco, if you can chat, uh, send your uh, mail ID in the chat box so that pe people can connect with you if any have questions. Yeah, Otherwise, just... they can they can reach out to us in Kose India chapter. Yeah, also on LinkedIn, I would send the email now, my email in the chat, copy it, but also in on LinkedIn, or you can reach to uh, to to the Incosi team. Okay. Thank you very much okay. again. Thank you. Uh, Bye-bye.